You're listening to the Eyes on Washington podcast, Holland and Knight's overarching public policy and regulation podcast series. Our public policy and regulation group has an ideal combination of lawyers and lobbyists with a comprehensive understanding of the federal policy and regulatory process. This series will shine a light on the shifting dynamics of governmental entities and the ensuing changes in economic or political policies, laws, and regulations that can have a critical impact on the health and future of your business. Hi, everybody. I'm Lauren Maddox, Senior Policy Advisor at Holland and Knight, and I'm joined today by Andy Rotherham. Andy is one of our nation's foremost thinkers, doers, reformers in education. He's the founder of a nonprofit education organization, which employs over 100. He's also serving right now on the Virginia State Board of Education. He's advised presidents, governors, cabinet secretaries, electeds on both sides of the aisle. He's also a prolific writer. He writes a great blog, Edgewalk. He's also a fisherman, lover of live music. He's a world traveler and a bicyclist. And I'm just going to add one more. He's also one of the nicest guys I've met in Washington, D.C. So I'm delighted to be here with Andy. And Andy, before we jump in and talk about education and politics, I'd love to hear more about your great adventure in August, your big bike ride. If you can tell us a little bit about that and the organization that you raise money for and have been raising money for for a long time. Wow, Lauren, what a generous introduction. Thank you. It's great to be here with you all. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, I mean, one of the anchor points in my year, I ride my bike across Massachusetts or most of Massachusetts from Sturbridge over out to uh, the tip of Cape Cod to Provincetown, which is a super fun place. It's about 192 miles and I raised money for Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and raised about a quarter million since I started doing it. And collectively, the PMC has raised almost a billion and will raise more than 70 million this year. And so it's a great bike ride and a great experience, but it's first and foremost a fundraiser to support the really amazing work that they do at Dana-Farber where... They're literally changing the arc of what's happening with cancer and, and helping people not only with treatments, but with things that ultimately research that's going to lead to cure. So it's exciting and it's, you know, outside of sort of family and, and work and so forth. It's the most meaningful thing I get to do every year. You have to train all year for that, Andy, or do you just hop on the bike every August? And go I should. It? I can't. I, no, I can't hop on the bike every <laughs> August. I spend a lot of time on my bike. I unfortunately can't say that I... Uh, I, I'm like a bear. I sort of hibernate a little bit in the winter and put on a few extra pounds. That I have to train off every spring. But um, yeah, it's, it's you know, it's, a, it's the first day we ride 112, the second day 80. It's nothing unmanageable, but you can't, if you just show up and try to do it, it'll bite you. So there's, there's some training, but that's, look, that's part of it. It reminds you why you're doing it and the commitment to it. And the cool thing is 100% of the money the riders raise passes through. I think anyone who's been around for a little while knows some of these athletic fundraisers can be real scams in terms of overhead and so forth. And the PMC's got this incredible 100% model. And so that encourages people like yourself. I'm always grateful for your donations to to really step up and help us really raise, again, a lot of money that that, that is changing lives. And all along the route, you see people who remind you of that. That's great. You've mentioned PMC a couple of times. You want to tell everybody what that is? For the guy who does a lot of external relations work at Bell, I'm, I'm lousy at external relations. I should have mentioned that. It's, uh, yeah, the Pan Mass Challenge. And so it's going to be its 45th year next year. And we raise money for the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, which is just an amazing research and treatment institute in Boston. That's great. So thank you for that, Andy. And thank you for all you're doing for cancer research. That's great. Let's pivot a little bit to education. You've been in the space for the better part of, of three decades. And I, I marveled at an answer that my old boss, uh, former Education Secretary Margaret Spellings, gave to a reporter one time when, when she was asked, you know, how she got into education. And she said, education found her, you know, as if it was some kind of a calling. And I love that answer, but I'm not sure that kind of works for everybody. So I guess I would ask you, did it find you? Did you find it? Did you pursue it? just really how'd you get into the space and frankly what keeps you in the space yeah it's a great question i guess kind of like margaret i, I can say like it, it found me out of the blue I, it was something i pursued because i just have always I, I mean early in my career i was an experiential educator spent time in outdoor education and i just never understood sort of just why in a country like this education is such a game of chance for kids depending on where you're born and look a lot of i'm sure a lot of people listen to your podcast are in the dc area 
which, I mean, we have absolutely world-class public schools in some of the places around D.C., and then we also have schools that are the envy of absolutely nowhere, one of the worst examples of how we do public education, and lots of things in between, and that's just in our community right here in the in the DMV, and I never understood that, and so it got its hooks into me. I, I think there are sort of immutable things in life that we can't change, but I don't think this is one of them. We can do better, and a lot of our problems, frankly, come down to to, to politics and, and sort of an unwillingness to really work together and do better. And so, like, I, I guess I'm attracted to problems that are both difficult but solvable, and, and this is one. Yeah. So I've been in the space probably about half as long as you've been in the space, and there's just a lot of frustration. I, I feel like sometimes we're dealing with the same issues over and over again. So in your time, do you, do you feel like that or are there sort of new issues that pop up and it seems to be like funding it seems to be just a perennial issue. You know, the, the Democrats and Republicans sort of disagree on terms so of the funding of it. But do you, you know, in, in your time, is it kind of a combination of old and new issues or are you just trying to look through a different lens to solve issues that have been around for a long time? Yeah. I mean, I guess embedded in your question is this idea, have we made progress? And I think we've made, in some cases, pretty astounding progress if you look at sort of the scope of how social policy changes historically in this country. I mean, when Bill Clinton said, I'm going to have 3,000 charter schools, that was his goal. People thought that was absolutely insane, unrealistic, something that he just like pulled out of thin air. We blew past that goal an awful long time ago. And, you know, there's one 7,000 charters. They're not all great, but many of them are absolutely fantastic schools that are changing trajectories for kids. No one saw that. Tom Kane up at Harvard has done really good work showing, you know, we were really seeing steady gains for the kids who were furthest from opportunity. So particularly low-income kids, Black students, Hispanic students, we were seeing steady gains. And we and we saw that we saw that into the middle of the last decade when it started to drop off and, and it was trending in the wrong direction even, even before the pandemic. So my frustration more than anything else is that we can't acknowledge that there has been progress. Things do work, double down on that. And then also say, here are the things that haven't worked and we need to reform. So money and abolishing the Department of Education, this kind of stuff, those are sort of like greatest hits. They just kind of keep coming back. They're not super productive conversations. But underneath that, yeah, a lot of stuff has happened and changed. And there's still some old problems, finance, school finance being one of them. And then there's there's new challenges. Obviously, the pandemic presented a whole set of new challenges in terms of what happened to kids during that. But I don't get frustrated with that. I do get frustrated with the lack of learning, the extent it's Sometimes it does both feel like Groundhog Day and feel like people aren't right. looking at the places where we have done well and we can we can learn from. Right. And I do want to touch on the pandemic because so much has been written. But before I do that, I just want you to talk a little bit about the education organization that you started really geared to transforming the system so that the system works for everybody, especially marginalized populations. So again, were you looking to, was it a policy vacuum that you were trying to fill? Was it just that you felt a different lens or lenses were needed uh, to sort of look at the needs of students and families and communities? Just can you talk a little bit about that and then maybe the work that you're doing there that's transforming education as we know it? It was both a practice and a policy to sit play. Essentially, you know, you reach this point in the aughts, particularly in the wake of the Bush administration, where reformers were still talking as though they were the insurgents, and they sort of fancied themselves as the insurgents, that they were still, you know, the Jedis fighting against the empire. But you looked and you're kind of like, well, you guys, you kind of are the empire. Like, you know, Arnie Duncan had become secretary of education. You had reformers leading states and school districts. Teach for America was, you know, really ascendant at that point. And the problem, it seemed to us, myself and my three co-founders was there's just not the capacity to do this. And we would sort of joke like, well, you didn't, you, you know, Teach for America is great, but maybe what we need is middle management for America because there just wasn't the capacity to execute on a lot of this stuff in a lot of places. And so that's what Bellwether was. It was how do we like address context and conditions through policy work, but also practice. And that model is the model that, that still we have today. So Half the shop is strategic advising, and those are sort of folks with a deep background in strategic advising and consulting, and we do lots of hands-on work with schools, with school districts, CMOs, states, foundations, other kind of intermediary organizations. We also do academic program advising, so we're in schools, helping schools with questions of curriculum, culture, strategy, things like that. And then the other side of the shop is policy and evaluation, which, as the name suggests, is 
you know, a lot of policy work, some proprietary for clients, some field facing, um, and a lot of evaluation work. Same thing, some field facing and some uh, proprietary helping people with, you know, internal learning and so forth. And we're still so, I mean, we've grown, you know, we, we went from four to more than 100, but we are still doing the, that same kind of work, which is how do you change context and conditions? How do you get help people get better? And I think that also gives you a good perspective on the debate. Our work, our policy work is informed by our hands-on work. And as frustrating as policy can be and, and the atmospherics and, and some of which you've given voice to, like when you're out there actually working with folks who are, who are on the ground doing the work, that's incredibly satisfying and it keeps you energized to keep wanting to come to work. Yeah. Is there a space that you prefer, Andy? Do you like the evaluation, the data, the, you know, that sort of thing or the policy development or do you just like it all? I like it all. That's my problem. Yeah. I like it all. I am. <laughs> I am I am incredibly happy if I get to be in a school and I get to sit with kindergartners and read to them. That is like for me about as good of a day as you're going to have. And I do also like analysis. I like solving problems. I like the big part of our work is constant learning. That's the that's the great part about being an analyst. And so I enjoy that. Yeah. So that's that's my problem. It's it, people are like, what do you like? And it's kind of like I like all of it. You're not just theory based. You're also you know sort of hands on, strategic learning, practical. You've also been an educator, correct? You've been in the classroom, both K-12 and higher ed. Yeah, more actually these days uh, over the years, much more much more higher ed. But yeah, early in my career, yeah, uh, both in experimental settings and uh, in a public middle school. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. There's a lot going on in higher ed in particular. But uh, let me, let's just talk about COVID for one minute too, because so much has been written. And I, I just would like you to sort of set the record straight. What's happening with kids? You're also serving on the Virginia State Board of Education. So- what data are you looking at? Tell us where kids are at. Is it as bad as we're hearing it is, or are there pockets of good things happening? I think it's worse, actually. I think I don't think people fully realize the extent of this. And it's not every kid, and we should be some kids thrived during the pandemic. But if you look at the data, there are a large number of kids who missed out on an awful lot of learning. And we don't have a real strategy yet to catch them up. And it's become incredibly politicized. And so I will say in Virginia, every time we raise this, you get an argument about, well, is it really a big deal? Do these tests really tell you anything? Should we be paying attention to other stuff? We have the largest learning loss of, of any state. We need to address that. It's not coincidentally our schools were closed longer than most places. And we need to address that. We need to make that up to these kids. We need to, to live up to the warranty that, that their parents expect from us in, in public education. And then there's also all the mental health stuff that's going on, which th these are all of this stuff was pre-existing issues to some extent, but the pandemic just exploded it. But again, every time you raise that, you get a fight about politics now. And it's sort of the Virginia governor, Glenn Young, can put out early in his term a analysis on achievement in Virginia that honestly was the kind of analysis the Education Trust could have written. That was, here's what's going on, here's what the data shows, here are the gaps, here's where we're not doing well when you break it out by, you know, race and income, here's where we're not doing well overall. And instead of people being like, oh yeah, this is like a call to action, we should come together, it just turned into the usual politics. And wow. I just think this is a time, there's plenty of stuff to argue about, this is a time we can ill afford, we can yeah. ill afford that. So you're saying that there were issues that existed before you know, the pandemic hit, but when you look back at the arc of your career, you know, what has changed? I guess, can you, can you just talk a little bit about the, sort of the bigger picture? Yeah. Well, I mean, I talked earlier about like what's changed in terms of achievement. If you look, we actually were making real progress. No Child Behind Act focused efforts on, on low achieving kids. And we've made real progress around things around school choice and so forth. And curriculum and standards are, are much better. There's a lot, there's lots of things. You know, when I got into this business, you had people who dissented. So like Dale Kildee was a Democrat from Michigan, George Miller, a Democrat from California, both in the House. They dissented from Democratic Party orthodoxy on accountability, and they felt like we needed to go a different direction. And what has happened is this, this intense polarization. We've lost the ability to sort of work across lines of difference. Everybody is now aligned with their tribe. And what that's given rise to is just this incredible amount of preference falsification where lots of people are saying stuff that privately they don't believe. And we see this on a range of issues. If you ask Democrats about some of those culture war issues privately, they're like, oh yeah, that's not good. Republicans are actually much more LGBT inclusive than you would know from the rhetoric. When, But like nobody can say that stuff. And so people are out there saying things on just a range of issues that they don't actually believe. And I think that's an unwelcome change if you believe in progress. And I think that's a major problem we've got to figure out how to get past and get back to just being able to have 
much more honest debates rather than just the absolute reflexive polarization, which not only has taken over our political life, but it's, it's, it's now taken over the education community. Yeah, you know, you raise a really good point, and I've written about this before, uh, you know, I talk about it to groups, and one of the questions I always get asked is, you know, how can you stand to live and work in that city? And, and you know, I mean, when you live and work here, you see the bipartisanship much more so than if you're just watching the cable shows and where you see none of that. So I don't know how we get past that. Even, you know, as we were talking about, even the presidential politics, you referenced this earlier about, you know, some of these Republican candidates now are talking about shutting down the Department of Education. You know, I, I served there. So I, I've got a sweet spot for the place. And but I think some people see it as more a financial institution than anything, but yet they're not regulated by one. They they believe all these decisions need to be made at the local level. I'm just not sure if that's a helpful message at this point. I think what, what we need to do is really talk about student needs and how to tackle those. And what's our strategy? I would love to hear in one of those debates, everyone abolish the Department of Education. It's this thing people say, I think education is predominantly a state responsibility. I'm a two-time state board member, but you have to have a national federal role. You have to have a national federal strategy. And I would like to hear when people say, I'm going to abolish this, be asked for a serious answer to, okay, if you look around the world, we face a variety of competitive threats and adversaries. If we get rid of the Department of Education, that's fine. Then what is your strategy for us having a national competitiveness strategy, which includes making sure we're not leaving so many people behind just because of where they happen to be born, but also that we're addressing all these competitive challenges like Sure, get rid of the Department of Education. What's your answer to that? I, I mean, yeah. I don't see how you do that with getting rid of a national agency like the department focused on that. I got, I'm not there, but that's at least the question people should be forced to answer is how would you then do that? Otherwise, it's just simply a throwaway that people love, but it doesn't make, I mean, leave, leave aside the mechanics of administering the money, just like how are you actually going to have any kind of a national competitiveness and sort of a strategy on sort of a, a more inclusive uh, economy and more social mobility. It just doesn't, it's hard, it's hard to see that happening absent yeah. the federal rule. No, I, I think that's right. Uh, let me shift gears real quick to AI, uh, artificial intelligence. You know, it's gathering steam on Capitol Hill. You know, the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is going to be convening a number of, of forums this fall on the issue. He's tasked the committees to try and come up with some bipartisan solutions. You have the top Republican on the Senate Education Committee, uh, Senator Bill Cassidy from Louisiana, releasing a white paper. He was talking about it, door cuts, but also the benefits, you know, freeing up more time for teachers to actually instruct. So he laid out a number of good questions, you know, frankly, to consider. And I know the EU is, is already moving pretty rapidly into developing sort of legislation that they hope to get to get through. So I guess the question is, you know, technology in general really hasn't had it. You, know, you walk into a classroom, it still kind of looks the same as when we were kids. Talk a little bit about AI. I'm, I'm guessing at Bellwether, uh, your education organization, you're probably doing some work in this space. But I guess what, you know, where do you come down on all of that? Yeah, we are doing some work in it. I don't come down anywhere yet because I think we're still in learning mode. And I think everybody, I do worry, you know, historically, generally two couple of things have happened. One, anytime you get a new technology, it freaks people out. I mean, you can remember, you know, back in the days, there was concerned about everybody having email and how are we going to regulate that? You know, printing presses at one point, they want to make, you had to have a license to have one. People thought this was like a dangerous technology, which in some ways it is, right? Print, you know, print the printed word, you know, is, is power and freedom. And so every time this stuff happens, you're sort of seeing this with AI, with these outright, we, we've got to ban it and so forth. Like, First of all, that's unrealistic. It's not going to happen. And second, it's, it's probably counterproductive. The second thing in education is you, every time we get a new wave of technology, you get people predicting this is the one and it's going to replace teachers. You know, So Edison thought record players were going to replace teachers because um, you'd be able to put the best lesson on it and then just like distribute that. Rickover, you know, Admiral Rickover, he thought the film strip, that was the final like breakthrough, right? And when's the last time you saw a film strip? There are some unique features of AI that I think could lead it to have a bigger impact than any of those technologies. But at the same time, to your point, like when you, in your question, there's two institutions that look basically the same way they looked 200 years ago, and that's schools and churches. And there's, there's something to that. I think the change will be, will be somewhat tempered, but the political scene is going to do sort of what it does with swirling around this. I'm more interested in sort of the applications that are being developed, what some of these companies are doing. There's a lot of stuff the rate of growth of just like creation of new companies coming into the ed sector, it's pretty remarkable. And a lot of it will bounce off. But I think some of it could be, you know, 
fairly transformative ideas. And in particular, a space I'm watching very closely is sort of tutoring and student engagement, because there seems to be some real potential there to do stuff differently than, we, than we've done with AI. Yeah, I mean, I think that does seem to be a bright spot. It just feels, you know, I mean, Congress is kind of a reactive body more than it is a proactive body. So I think to move forward on sort of legislation funding, you know, somebody in the Senate shared that, uh, you know, they're, they're looking to put something in appropriations. I don't know exactly what that would be, but it just feels a little soon until we kind of get our heads around what this is and the impact. But again, if you know, sort of this white paper asked a whole bunch of questions you know, thoughtful. It wasn't just a, yeah. they weren't negative. They were just, you know, let's get our head around it and, and how can students benefit from it. But I did read, I think it was a New York public school, New York City public schools who trying to sort of put a lid on it. I think a little worried about chat GPT, which I think created sort of movement in this space. So I'm not, I think putting a lid on it probably is not, not the right answer. So the question is, you know, just, but what do we do? Especially watching the yeah. EU, I think it you know, maybe we just watch and see what happens there for a little bit longer before we start, you know, because you, you don't want to stifle innovation. Like you said, there's just a lot of companies that are now in the space and trying to figure this out. So, yes, yeah, schools have a long and storied history of trying to ban stuff that young people want to do and failing to do it. And I suspect this will be the same thing. I worry it's not a replacement for doing your own research. And how do we help like any other technology or new thing? How do we actually empower students to engage with it? smartly and thoughtfully. And schools can sometimes kind of be a, a stagger step behind on addressing things like that. And so that's a place because it is going to change things that, we, that we're going to have to do better. Yeah. Andy, so as we're closing this out, I spend another hour talking about it, but I, I just want to talk to you just personally, your sort of advocacy style. First of all, you like I've mentioned, you you work across a political spectrum. You've got electeds who, who want the benefit of your wisdom as they develop and execute on their own education agendas. But just talk about, you know, you, you've been able to do this. Why, why aren't there more people who do this, who can work across the aisle and listen and learn and help each other get to a better place? But, you know, sort of has your advocacy style changed over the years or is it just the, the Andy of 30 years ago is the Andy we see today and you're just about finding the right solutions for these you know, challenges that we're facing? Well, I hope I'm not the same. I hope I've learned some stuff over 30 years. Uh, I really mean that. I do think I was impatient and I'm even more probably impatient now. And one experience is, you know, when I had kids, my girls are seniors in high school now. And I remember when I had kids, there were some people who were like, oh, now you'll be more understanding. And actually as a, I became even less patient because I was like, I'm not going to put up with this stuff for my kids and this sort of dysfunction. And so why should anybody else have to? And I'm a relatively empowered person and things that would, my kids would experience, I'd be like, what would this be like if you, this is not acceptable and we can do something about it because we're empowered if you're not empowered in those ways. And so it's actually made me like that, that whole experience has actually made me more impatient on sort of the urgency and needing to do something. I have become more skeptical of different kinds of solutions because I've seen things, you know, work and not work and so forth. And so I think if anything's changed, like I'm more of a blend of those things one thing that hasn't changed, I used to, people would be like, you can't talk frankly about these things. And I was always like, why? And I'm still, I still have that instinct. Like, I feel, I feel so incredibly blessed to be an American and live in a country that has a first amendment. And if you travel around the world or your family, as my family did, came here from elsewhere, you, you realize what a precious thing that is. And I do not understand in our education culture, why people don't take more full advantage of that. And it's, it's instrumental to progress. That's the only way we get anywhere is talking frankly about things, learning from each other, making mistakes and learning and errors and learning from them. And so I still just try to continue to lean into that. So, and it's why you're so good at what you do. I mean, you hit on something as well. The, the one thing too, coming out of COVID, it just seems parents more engaged or they want to be closer to what their kids are doing, or they sort of forced to be because everybody was at home and they were hearing it or it just seems like parents are, they're not afraid anymore to jump in there to, is that just my own observation or is that what you're seeing kind of across the board? No, I do think the pandemic fundamentally changed people's relationship with schools in different ways. One, people felt like this institution always had their best interest at heart and had their back. And it was clear in a lot of cases that was not the case. There was decisions that were being made for politics or for adult reasons and so forth. And so I think that Plus, people got a good look at what was going on or not going on in the classroom, learning level of work. And so I do think you can overstate that everything's changed. Or everybody now is sour on the public schools. I don't think those things are true, but I do think something changed in that relationship. 
And the question is, how durable will that be? Because the one thing with schools, parents are moving through, you know, like it, it's hard for me to believe I won't be a public school parent a year from now. Right. And that's like, that's hard for me to get my head around because that's like been something I've been, you know, more than a decade, but there'll be other parents along. And so is that relationship changed in ways that are, are going to be permanent or as we get newer parents through and parents age out of the system, will that, will things revert? I don't think, I don't think anybody knows, but right now I think you're spot on. Something is different. With that, Andy, let's wrap. I think it's going to be a, uh, a busy year uh, with the election uh, um, and with the end of the end of this session. I don't know how much they're going to get done le legislatively uh, on education, but um, maybe more so on the state level than on the federal level. So we'll watch what happens in Virginia in particular. Yeah, there's definitely stuff happening. And thank you so much for having me. This was fun. Yeah, this was great. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to the Eyes on Washington podcast, brought to you by Holland and Knight's Public Policy and Regulation Group. For more information on our Public Policy and Regulation Group, please visit hklaw.com slash PPR.